Good morning. You know, what's really interesting listening to the folks around here is that I don't have this in my slide deck, but uh, Sweden's about to enact the Convention on the Rights of the Child into law, January 1st, 2020. That's an amazing statement to enact the articles of that convention, which protect children and design for optimal health and growth. Physical literacy is a lifespan issue, we know that. It's from zero to 112, 113 year olds not welcome. But it is an amazing opportunity for Sweden to demonstrate to the world how physical literacy can be integrated with that convention and develop children physically, socially, and mentally to their optimal levels. That's a brave statement for the Swedes to do because they're not perfect, no country is. And, but to protect your children by enacting such a convention into law is an amazing thing, so thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna talk about physical literacy, that's my hometown right there, um, Winnipeg. And we have machines, Zamboni machines, that drive along our sidewalks and make them glare ice. We actually make our sidewalks ice. That's kind of the Winnipeg way. And I'm gonna talk about design, physical literacy enriched design, but I know many of you are first timers to the International Physical Literacy Conference and have some level of understanding of physical literacy. So I'm gonna to try to help you out understand how I see physical literacy. So today, although I am a scientist and I publish lots of papers on physical literacy, I'm gonna to talk to you more about a, trying to be a contributor to the change that we need in this world. Richard said something uh, very appropriate. He said, we've had an insidious circumstance happening. And the definition of insidious is right there in front of you, proceeding in a gradual, subtle way with pretty serious negative consequences. And this is truly what has happened. Our culture has shifted for a very long time. And I'm gonna talk to you about the history of that insidiousness and why we aren't acting as fast as we could. Whoops. About in 1760 to about 1840 in this world, what was really interesting about that time period is that mechanization occurred. We had steam engines, conveyor belts. We could move around in big boats faster. And that industrial revolution was identified by scientists and people as a time in which, boy, that is actually gonna influence the way we move. And in the industrial era, the average life expectancy of around the world was around 40 years of age. 40. We're well above that now, as you know. That was around 1840. Then there was an interesting change. A guy named uh, Benz, Carl Benz made a machine that had three wheels, the motor wagon, and it had three wheels and a steam engine, and that was the first car made in 1885. And about 15 or 20 years later in New York City, there are about 10 to 12 million Model T Fords driving the streets. And at that time, a large number of people looked at this horseless carriage and said, boy, oh boy, that's gonna influence our lives and we're gonna not move around as much or we're gonna move around a lot more, but not human powered. And at that time, the definition of physical literacy was first created. It was by an American who defined the word definition back in 1885 based on this observation. It's not a new term. Physical literacy has been around for over 100 years, and every single time there's been a threat to our lifestyle, the word reappears. And my hope is, as Richard indicated, with the growing rapid interest in physical literacy, that we actually have something that might make the change. But it's not new, it's just caught on fire. Hopefully the birch trees don't stop that fire from happening. Sorry for integrating Umio's pride and joy. 
The electronics era happened after that, and you'll notice that what's happening here is the electronics era in Bell Labs in New Jersey. Three scientists got together and created the transistor, 1947. And what's interesting about that day is that that then was the foundation of making computers. And the first computer didn't come out till 1972, but what's relevant about that, calculators came out. We didn't use abacuses anymore or slide rules. I still have mine. We got a machine that could actually compute for us. That's the electronics era, and then a computer thereafter. And certainly, when that happened, a bunch of folks got together and said, oh boy, we're going to sit in front of that machine a lot. And the word physical literacy popped up again in the literature. It'll save us. Nobody listened. Then the internet happened. About 1973, it was actually created. But the World Wide Web, WWW, didn't exist till 1990. And then we had this era happen. And you'll see that these threats to lifestyle are getting closer and closer together in time, rapidly. The internet era created a new time, and Margaret Whitehead um, was one of the philosophers out of England who certainly wrote a paper in 2001 about physical literacy, in part related to her desire to see a foundational acceptance of the desire to move. And I certainly agree with that one. I certainly read that paper, and that's the paper that made me do what I do today, 100%. But she reacted to this society we have and said we need to value movement at the core. And all of these things, created by engineers, weren't made to hurt us. They were made to help us. But insidiously, it's made us change our culture. I'm going to call this a new era now. It's no longer the internet era. It's the spectator era. There are more spectators than participants in this world. Every single World Cup of soccer that happens, the men's version right now, there's about 30 to 40 billion views of the games. And I don't know what you do in Sweden to watch a football match, although I do. I did watch the Norway game. Not entirely, but I saw a 1-1 tie, which was good for Sweden, not so good for Norway. But when you sit down normally for that game, you have a 12-pack of beer and some nachos, and you sit for a few hours. The number of people that are playing the game or move it, moving on the field are around 25, 11 people on each side and some referees. And they play for roughly 94 minutes. So you get 50,000 people in Friends Stadium watching 25 people move. You can do the math. 50,000 times a couple hours sitting down, plus all the people watching it on TV, divided by 25 people moving for 94 minutes. You set the world record for physical inactivity in Sweden for that day. We are great spectators. And I'm not against spectation, but we need participation on equal value to that. And it is so easy to be a spectator today for children and adults. And I'm not anti sport or Olympics or anything like that, I'm pro that. But how do we create a balance? Our world has valued knowledge from the mechanized era back in 1760 to 1840. Knowledge is what made those things get created. People said, I'm curious, like Umio, I want to know things and I want to do things and I want to build things. That's truly what happened for the mechanized era, the electronics era, the internet era. All of those things were buildings created by knowledge because we, as human beings, value knowing things. We are curious. We're like raccoons. Can't keep our paws out of things. So that made this world value literacy. About in 1900, people said, reading and writing is really important. Sweden did that, Canada did that, United States did that. Virtually every country in the world said, 
you need to be able to read and write to participate in this world. Because we value knowledge. The more knowledge we have, the better off we're going to be. It's been around for a long time. Numeracy, numerical literacy is no different. Without engineering science, we can't do those marvelous things. Do I believe in that? I'm a university professor. Absolutely. Has that made our world better? Yeah, it has. Is it perfect? No. But literacy and numeracy has not been sufficient to make us better in all ways. We're missing a piece. And you can see where I'm going with this. This is interesting because the life expectancy of people back in 1840 was 40 years of age. And I'm going to tell you something that is very important to understand. Every four years of life, every four years in the world since 1800, we've increased our life expectancy by one year. Every four years, we increase our life expectancy by one year, still to this day, by the way. Our life expectancy as birth has gone from 40 to well over the 70, 80s. Every four years, it increases a year. Why is that? Because we're healthier? Absolutely not. It's because we value our health care. If you get sick, we're going to help you. So therefore, our knowledge will help us help you not die. That's 100% true. Our life expectancy has nothing to do with becoming fitter or healthier. It's have everything to do with having knowledge to intervene in the process of disease. There's childhood mortality, maternal mortality has reduced dramatically due to this. Hygiene has improved due to this. Vaccines have changed due to knowledge. That's a good thing. Life expectancy goes up. But interestingly enough, if you look at the cost of life expectancy, there's been a linear increase in the healthcare budgets from about 1 or 2% of total GDP to 7 to 13% over this time. So I submit to you, we value our health care, but we don't value our health. That's a proposition. So the there's zero doubt, and I don't need to give you a slide on the deteriorating human condition. If you're physically inactive, there are 26 non-communicable diseases that are pro proportionate to it in risk. You are physically inactive, you increase your risk, of type 2 diabetes, obesity, depression, psychological and physical conditions, 26. Well evidenced. And on top of that, there are numerous studies that show if you're physically inactive, that your movement competency reduces, then you get injuries like hip fractures, which is not a disease. So if you count all those injuries, it's over 17 types of injuries related to motor competence, plus the 26 diseases related to it, physical inactivity has a very significant impact, without question, on health. And for 40 or 50 years, all the countries in the world have said, eat well, exercise regularly, as the campaign to try to fix this. And it doesn't work. It's true, but it's not a good health message. So. Wisdom means that you have knowledge, and we have the knowledge that physical activity works. If you're wise, you do things about it. If you're knowledgeable, that's interesting. I would say we are knowledgeable, but not yet wise. Enlightenment means you follow, eat well, exercise regularly. So hopefully you're seeing at this point that this is a social problem, not an exercise physiology problem. This is changing our culture through some sort of transformative social innovation. So I'm standing here, and I, you're going to hear me say, physical literacy might actually be the agent of change in a social way. 
We live in a movement-suppressed culture, and it has many consequences. One of them is the loss of free-range behavior of our children. In 1917, children could walk 10 kilometers age eight without adult supervision. Today, barely 300 meters. That's true in Canada, Sweden, United States, almost every country I visit in the world, children cannot negotiate and navigate their own world without adult supervision. That's an impact of a movement-suppressed culture. It happened insidiously and slowly. This is a fun one. Risky play, to me, is something that was very important to me as a Canadian, and our Canadian uniform. Can, I, can you throw me the Canadian uniform? I just need to hold it for a second because I feel better. This is a Canadian tuxedo. <laughs> That's what we, we wear. And as a Canadian, most of us my age will actually realize that, you know, we'd run and tickle polar bears and then run away to try to not get eaten when we were young. That's what my grandpa did. And, you know, I would chase black bears and jump on their back and ride for a while. And the funny thing is, my son's favorite activity has nothing to do with that. It's playing on his phone. In one generation, we've gone from a love of interaction in the world to a love and interaction of a device. That device isn't evil, is it? It doesn't have devil inside of it. It's a thing, but it's a very attractive thing. I, I submit to you, everybody, take your phone out. Don't do it, actually. Throw it at me on the stage. I'll hide it for the next week. Let's see how we get along. Anxiety disorders will be created massively. I'll bring that back to you. Oh, let me go back one. I want you to think about the last time you played. For me, it was last night. I was playing for four hours straight with a group of 60 individuals. We played together as adults. And we did these things, actually. And I want you to think about the last time you played could have been this morning, 30 years ago, I don't know. And I want you to think about that moment that was great play. Just think about it. And then with the person beside you or maybe people behind you, I want you to take a minute to explain what you were doing that was such good play. Ready? Go. Just one second. I apologize for making you smile. <laughs> Virtually everybody had a smile on their face sharing that story, and you were fully engaged in the conversation of sharing something that was, you valued. And I have to cut you off because I've got to finish this, but because it is a really interesting discussion to have, and then actually take a group of children and have them do the same thing and listen to what they say. Very valuable to do. The stories you are just sharing as an adult are very important not to share between adults, but between you and your children, vitally. Oh, such great heights. If I'm a five-year-old and I stand on the edge of this precipice, for a five-year-old, this is oh, such great heights. It's not being up in the rafters. Getting lost. If you take these two chairs right there, the green ones, oh, they're all green, because it's birchy and you take those chairs and you put a blanket over them, a five-year-old will go underneath naturally to get lost. From a child's perspective, that is getting lost. Going underneath the blankets, not taking them and putting 30 kilometers into the woods. It's those experiences which are part of physical literacy that are vital to maintain in the society where movement has suppressed them. You all had these. I'm going to do a check. If 
Your experience that you were discussing and smiling about, the joy of movement, involved great heights. I'd like you to stand up. If you're experienced, yeah, stand up now. Good. Keep standing. Keep standing. If your experience involved high speed, stand up. Keep standing. If, you're in, if it involved the dangerous spatula playing on some plastic items, dangerous tool elements, stand up. If your experience involved rough and tumble play between two people, stand up. If your experience was the all favorite getting lost, stand up. Interesting, right? What a wonderful research study to do on children today. The test of what I just did here on adults, which has almost 100% participation in a transformative part of your life, improving your brain and your body. That's what risky play does. Very little doubt about that. So the absence of this will change who you are. It'll change your brain. Neuroplasticity will happen. Lack of free range. So our job, we've all experienced that joy of movement. The question is, is that still present in our children? Good question. So part of physical literacy is restoring risky play. They're not the same, but risky play is part of physical literacy. Thank you. You can have a seat. So here's the first step in physical literacy enriched design thinking. And it is a vital part of the discussion about physical literacy. Any activity that you do has a risk, a chance of something happening. And if you do an activity like play, I had almost 100% confirmation, 100% that play generates 100% of the time an outcome, and it's called joy. You all showed that to me by smiles. You had joy of movement. There's a, almost 100% risk, a positive outcome called joy. In any of that risky play, there is a potential to have a negative outcome. Whoops. An injury. You could get scruff your elbow, even sprain your ankle possibly, very rarely, get severely hurt. There are potential negative outcomes of risky play. Anything, actually. Society is risk adverse and only ever thinks about the negative outcome of an activity. And our society looks at negative outcomes today because we're oh so knowledgeable and says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create surplus safety. I'm going to put a bubble around things so that I never get a negative outcome, which therefore free-range behavior reduces. Outdoor activities reduce. Possibilities of risky play are suppressed because we want to eliminate negative outcomes, which the scary part about that is it eliminates also the positive. And the downstream effect of that is that it creates long-term negatives, <coughs> childhood anxiety disorders, type 2 diabetes. So the game isn't any more about creating surplus safety, it's about creating adequate safety. What does adequate safety look like? In Canada, we've had a school ban cartwheels. That's surplus safety. That's called safety creep disproportionate safety thinking related to an incident or an event that is not rational, safety creep. Part of being physically literate is a person being able to defend themselves in a context of safety creep. We all need to have an intelligent way to defend adequate safety and remove surplus safety. In Sweden, with the convention, on the rights of the child, if you do not provide adequate playtime, Article 31 of the Convention, you are harming a child by definition. So therefore, 
the absence of the play by any sort of safety creep creating a surplus bubble of safety around a child needs to be removed, needs to be addressed. So any movement that we do relates to who we are. It's our identity. Lack of movement changes our identity as a human being. So physical literacy, which we'll talk about later, is not just about movement skills. It's about a psychology, about a sociology. It's psychological, physical, and social. And that's the magic of physical literacy. It brings everybody to the table because everybody fits under the umbrella. So what is physical literacy? It is very distinctly different than physical activity. Physical activity, make people sweaty messes. Get better cardiovascular fitness. Don't get non-communicable diseases. Am I in? 100%. But it's very different than thinking about how do you create a physically literate culture as opposed to a physically active culture. Do we need physical activity? 100%. But we failed over 40 years to try to get it. Failed. So maybe, maybe physical literacy, it certainly is a different lens of looking at things. And for us, I implore you to try to truly understand how physical activity is different from physical literacy and have a clear articulation of that when you leave this space. So physical literacy can be defined, and there are maybe 42 definitions worldwide. They're basically the same. They have the same core words. I even did a Wordle diagram of them. And the same words appear over and over in physical literacy definitions from 1885 till now. But if you have a definition, you'd think about a state. Are you physically literate? Are you physically literate? That's a state. Are you? I actually think about physical literacy in a completely different way nowadays. That's why I don't get caught in a debate about the definition. It'll settle. I'm not worried about that. I think physical literacy is a process. Published a paper on that just recently. Well accepted, that's great, yeehaw. But what was important was that that paper that John, Dean, and I wrote, and a few others, on physical literacy as a process, leading to physical activity, leading to social, emotional, and physical well-being. We wrote a year and a bit ago, Dean, the other Dean Dudley over there, sitting at a restaurant on a napkin a year and a half ago. So I'm going to show you the napkin from a week ago so you don't have to wait a year and a half. Physical literacy is a process. There are no doubts that movement competence, the ability to move well in land, air, ice, snow, water, are fundamental to physical literacy, but not just in the context of physical environments, movement competence in land, air, ice, no water, but also in social contexts, cultural contexts. Context of movement is relevant. Feeling comfortable moving in front of one another is a social context. That's as much of physical literacy as being able to walk on ice, a very important life-saving thing. Movement competence is also not just about throwing an object, it's about detecting hazards in our environment. I will walk differently if I walk on ice compared to walking on level ground. That's spatial awareness. It's not just about form and of movement skills. It's much bigger than that. Move, movement competence in the biggest way you can think. The other words that are very common in it, in definitions, is the word confidence. Confidence at the same time as competence is really the foundational thinking related to physical literacy. I want to create a world with competent, confident movers in all contexts. That's how I see it. That's a simple way. That's my elevator speech. Competent, confident movers in all contexts. Sounds good to me. But another word we have is motivation. Hey. You better be eager to participate, and that's motivation. I want to do things. I feel intrinsically that I should do this, although 
It's not always better to be intrinsically motivated. I got my PhD to get a job. That's an extrinsic motivation. That's okay sometimes. Hey, if I run a marathon, can I eat a cheeseburger? Sure. <laughs> can I have some semla? At the good time of year, I love semla. I just learned about that recently. Very yummy. But anyway, motivation. The other word, and I'm going to substitute the word, and I encourage you to adopt this. You don't have to. I'd like to have a discussion about it. Physical activity is not the outcome of physical literacy. That's for the non-communicable disease people to believe in. Physical literacy is to help people actively participate in society, whether it's working in a vocation, doing activity daily living, participating in sport, recreation, performance arts. That's a social construct, participating in this world, which is like literacy, active participation. So if we are all physically literate, I think the world gets better health equity. That's an outcome I want to put on the table. I think we get better social equity. We treat each other better if we're physically literate because we're inclusive by design. And we get really good human capital. We can work harder. Those are pretty good outcomes. I'm not here to reduce non-communicable disease. I'm here for those three reasons. I like positive. But also, if we get rid of the diseases, I'm in, too. So physical literacy could be an engine as opposed to a process. That's nice to say it as a process, but I think of it as an engine, a transformative social innovation engine. This is the napkin. So I'm going to talk you through the napkin so you can see a year and a half from now. Yeah, it's good to take the picture now because it won't come out in press for about a year, although we have a special issue to get it into. If you make people have movement competence, you can develop confidence, which will drive motivation, which will drive active participation. That's the root cycle. There's actually evidence for every single one of those arrows. There's not a single word on that screen that's new to science, except for the physical literacy engine. Every single one of those arrows, even though it's a cartoon, has moderately good evidence. It's just never been put in that cycle. I'm going to talk you through it again. You can create confidence and, co and motor competence. There's multiple papers, multiple studies, hundreds, that show confidence or self-competence is related to movement competence. How do you develop those pedagogically in, in sport, leisure, or education isn't well understood. But are they related? Yes. And there's clear evidence that if you develop movement competence and confidence, it'll drive your self-competence, which then, through self-determination theory, drives motivation. And there's really good research now on fun and enjoyment, showing that if you make your experiences and active participation enjoyable, it drives motivation. If you make any positive challenge that peoples have in sport, recreation, physical education, or in a playground, if you make that positive challenge be enjoyable, it also drives motivation. And if you have people actively participating in this world, and they connect with others, that doesn't mean friendship, or they connect with an object, I like this rock, or they connect with an animal, I'm an equestrian, or they connect with a group, I'm a crossfitter. Connection with your environment, whether it's earth, an object, another being, or another human, drives what's called relatedness. That's a self-determination theory thinking. If you drive that, you drive more motivation. Do you see the cycle? Nothing complex in that. It's a bunch of positive feedback loops, isn't it? But if you break it anywhere, it messes things up. And you see the word resilience there? Just had a paper accepted this morning. First study ever to show that resilience, the ability 
to deal with adversity in life, that's resilience. Is large, the greatest predictor of it is physical literacy. The greatest single predictor of resiliency. That's impressive. I'm going like, yeah, I was dancing as a scientist. A scientist dance, not the salmon thing. But that's the cycle. Now, this is interesting because that's how I think. There's a lot of us who think this way. It connects the dots from many different theories in science and makes it logical that if you make this cycle work and make that engine work and you become physically literate and you get a positive complete cycle, your likelihood of doing something else increases. And if that happens, you also, if you go through this cycle, you're more in interested in how other people are doing as well because you're going to be inclusive because you'll realize that failure is part of success, not the opposite of it. So, whoops. The design part. If you take physical literacy, you can put it in three places. You can make physically literate people, you can make physically literate programs, like physical education curriculum, like sports clubs, and you can make places physically literate. But you can't just make places, you need to train the people, and you need to make the programs. So they have to be considered simultaneously, as opposed to individually. Physical literacy thinks that way. So here's an example of thinking related to physical literacy. I don't like the term active transport. I think it's non-inclusive and narrow. I prefer the term mobility-enriched environment. Much better term. It's positive. It's not just thinking about riding a bike from one place to another. That's non-inclusive. That's not how all people ride bikes. But do I believe in active transport? Sure. But I much prefer a city that is mobility enriched. Different thinking, right? Different lens. Whoops. And the concept of programs, where I live, we no longer use the term falls prevention. First off, it's fear-mongering. And there's clear evidence that if you say false prevention to older adults, it keeps them indoors, leading to social isolation and depression. No hip fractures, yay. Trade one for another, not good. So we use the term mobility enhancement. Oh, yeah, I want to learn how to walk on ice when I'm 70. Don't you? It's called curling. Curling's a good thing. Because I've seen these. In Canada, we have 800,000 curlers. 500,000 are over my age. And they are competent, confident movers on ice. That's good. And they're enjoying themselves. They even have beer fika. But why would you make them scared? Don't go on ice if you're over 60. What a ridiculous statement. The largest group of people that fall are children. There's a small amount of adults that fall. It's not falling that's the issue. It's falling poorly, not being able to spot the hazard, and not having competence and confidence to walk on ice. That's a completely different way of thinking. Mobility enhancement. Our culture is risk adverse. Safety bubbles around everywhere. I want everybody to be explorative, not fearing failure, not fearing safety issues. I want to be explorative. The words matter. Construction of positive challenges. That's a new term that's coming out. How do you, as practitioners, create positive challenges? There's a thing called optimal, th optimal challenge theory that says, hey, if you make something really hard for me, I'm out. If you make it really easy, I'm out. You make it just right, I'm in. The challenge is, if you're inclusive, if you're inclusive, to create a level of challenge for all levels of ability. That's design thinking. A level of challenge for all levels of ability. Whoops. That's a fundamental tenet of physical literacy. 
if you are developing a program, a park, a place, you had better develop a level of challenge for all levels of ability. If you, and check that at the door and start your design process. Does my park do that? Does my space do that? Does my program do that? The other design term, and this is a really important one, you should have a variety of challenges for all forms of interest. I like to roller skate one day. I like to run the next. I like to ride my fat bike on certain days. I change my interests. Don't you? So it's not just about covering the range of abilities, it's about covering the range of interests. If you just have a, a parkway, sorry, a path that's for bikes, that's non-inclusive. That does not cover all ranges of ability. That does not cover all ranges of interests. You're excluding people if you only have a bicycle path. It is non-inclusive. One concept we use also is the concept of movement intersection. We make bicycle park over there, skate park over there, cross-country ski facility over there, another facility over here. The people in each of those facilities never see each other. And worse yet, if I'm doing one thing in the skate park, I don't see another option, that's all my options are. So in my city, we've done this. Using physical literacy design principles, we take our winter environment and we create a level of challenge for all levels of ability. We, take, we combine so many different opportunities in our city that they can actually choose different options on any given day. All interests are covered. We went from 3,000 people a day in minus 28 on Friday afternoons to 30,000 people a day, which you see here. That's Friday afternoon, minus 28. And you see the diversity and range of people and experiences that are occurring there. That is a completely different way of thinking than get active. It's all about, and creating a single linear path. If you are very observant in there, you're going to see a lot of interesting uh, behaviors going on there. We do this sort of surveillance on all our trails and do research-based analysis on it. But why I'm showing this to you is that this is physical literacy and rich design. So I conclude by hopefully saying to you, I'm interested in moving towards a world that values movement. And I think, and I propose to you, the physical literacy engine is the tool to do that. Thank you very much.